All sergeants, please start your recordings. I have started the PC recording. All recording rolling. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public uh, Sightings and Dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification purposes. And to minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Riley, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. I am joined remotely today by Council Members Kuhl, Barron, Miller, Traeger, Levin, and Gibson. Today we will be hearing the designation of Harriet and Thomas Truesdale as a historic landmark, the 97 West 169th Street, UDAP, and the amendments to, to the 2017 approvals of the Sendero Verde, UDAP, and Article 11 tax exemption. Before we begin our public hearing, we will vote on three items previously heard at our March 22nd and April 6th meetings. We will vote to approve LU752, the 69 Adams Street project. This is an application submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services pursuant to section 197C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of city-owned property located on the west side of Pearl Street between York and Front Street at Block 52, Lots 15 and 17 in the borough of Brooklyn. This application will facilitate the transfer of 98,446 square feet development rights to an adjacent privately owned site. The proposed project is a 25-story mixed use building with residential and commercial uses located at 69 Adams Street in the Dumble neighborhood of Brooklyn represented by Council Member Levin. I now recognize Council Member Levin to offer remarks on the negotiations that may have taken place since our March 22nd meeting. Council Member Levin, you may have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, the introduction um, and your assistance in, um, in helping the process of this project. Um, uh, I want to um, uh, first off thank all of the local residents um, in the uh, greater Dumbo community, um, uh, the uh, Farragut houses, um, uh, the PS307 community um, uh, for um, uh, for, for a, a lot of hours spent on Zoom calls um, going over the details of this proposal. Um, uh, so uh, uh, as Chair Riley mentioned, this is, um, this is an existing as of right development site. It's an R9 residential development site that was rezoned um, a number of years ago before MIH um, and before our time here in the council um, and, um, and so there is an as of right uh, market rate development um, uh, potential already. Um, and that would be a 25 story building um, adjacent to the bridge, um, market rate residential. Um, what this uh, proposal would do is uh, take the air rights that are in an adjacent parcel um, that are unusable because they're underneath uh, the Manhattan Bridge um, and sell them to the developer um, for a for a fair market price, um, uh, and that price was uh, one hundred and seventy five dollars a square foot for commercial um, uh, development. So it would be adding 90,000 90, square feet of commercial development um, to this building. Now, since the the maximum height of the building is twenty five stories um, and that would remain the building goes from being a uh, very slender 25 story building uh, to a to a bulkier 25 story building because it would be adding um, the commercial floor area to to the base pedestal of the building um, 
the so uh, that one hundred and seventy five dollars a square foot for ninety thousand square feet total seventeen point two million dollars that that's the proceeds of this sale um, uh, through extensive negotiations um, with the city um, and EDC um, we have identified that $10 million of that $17 million will be going back into the community. Um, the breakdown of that $10 million is that uh, $1.5 million will be going to the Farragut uh, Houses community in a um, to be determined by the, Farragut, the residents of Farragut, the Tenants Association and the Farragut Stakeholder Group. Um, and so not determined by NYCHA, not determined by my office, determined by the residents at Farragut, $1.5 million. Um, one, that, could be all, that could be either expense or uh, capital as determined by the residents. Um, uh, in addition, $1.5 million to the PS307 community um, as determined by the principal of PS307, Stephanie Carroll, um, who has been um, uh, a great partner um, and, um, and a principal that has done amazing work at, at that uh, elementary school, PS307. So $1.5 million uh, to, be, to be determined uh, by, by, uh, by the principal at 307. Um, in addition, um, the, um, the main issue that we have heard, and for those of you that know Dumbo, um, the big issue in the neighborhood infrastructure wise is the York Street uh, subway station. Um, it is the, the entire neighborhood is served by a single uh, subway station and it is uh, antiquated and unsafe. Um, it is, um, there's a single entrance on the corner of York and J Street. Um, uh, that entrance then leads to a 250 foot corridor, um, uh, which then leads down a set of stairs to a 250 foot platform. Um, and at the end of that 250 foot platform is a dead end. So um, essentially um, you could get off the train at York Street and be 500 feet from the exit. Um, um, that is a dangerous situation for workers, MTA workers and passengers. Um, and we know that the proceeds of the sale can't uh, cover the cost of an entirely new accessible entrance. It's also not an accessible station. Um, we know that, that, that's, that that's true. And there are significant engineering challenges because it is the first station off of the, um, uh, uh, the East River that, um, and so the tube itself goes into the station. Um, so there's only, uh, the only opportunity for an, an accessibility at the station is to have a second entrance, an accessible entrance at the southern end of the platform, um, which is um, uh, around the corner of Sands and J Street. Um, this, is, uh, this is located right at the entrance to the foot entrance to the Manhattan Bridge, uh, as well as um, uh, for those of you that know the downtown area, um, uh, a um, an annex to uh, CUNY um, City Tech, and um, and is actually the site next to the site of a um, of a 500 unit uh, supportive housing slash affordable housing development that's in that's going to be opening in the next probably 18 months. Uh, that breaking ground is doing. Um, that's the former Jehovah's Witnesses dormitory building. Um, so. Uh, so that's the great need in the community. The, the proceeds will have of this sale will cover um, seven million dollars to the York Street Station, uh, 1.5 to pay for a conceptual design study that will be commencing in the next couple of months, and then depending on what that conceptual design study uh, uh, yields, um, the remaining 5.5 would then go to cover um, related. Um, uh, capital needs um, that could be um, additional design work on a second entrance um, and or uh, if that's not feasible um, then uh, other improvements to the station to the existing station so moving the turnstiles um, uh, things like that um, 
it is uh, the the goal in all of this is to is to uh, uh, make this project as far along as possible a second accessible entrance to the York Street Station, so that the MTA um, uh, would see it as uh, a um, a good and expeditious and worthwhile project to pursue in the next capital plan, the next MTA capital plan. Um, unfortunately, they were not uh, able to give a commitment um, that it would go into the next capital plan. But again, getting design work, pre-design work, um, getting the ball rolling, I think is actually very important and, 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 and beneficial. Um, you know, and we're also hopeful that, that um, you know, with infrastructure, with the federal infrastructure plan, um, that this could potentially be um, a recipient of those funds. Um, the last uh, large piece of this is a um, is is a large portion of of uh, uh, land in the Dumbo area um, on the corner of Prospect and Washington Street, um, which which connects on an underpass to Cadden Plaza West, um, uh, and this. Uh, the DOT and Parks Department has agreed to make that entirely publicly accessible and open to the public um, within two years. Um, so we had hoped that we would um, uh, basically have DOT um, out of all of the sites that they occupy in Dumbo. They occupy about uh, five or six parcels. This is the largest one and, um, and is currently being used by a contract to do Brooklyn Bridge repair. Um, but but in the long term, they've agreed to turn it over to the public um, and be publicly accessible space. Um, so that those are the broad outlines of this um, uh, of this um, uh, uh, proposal as it exists right now. I am, you know, I'm not enthusiastically supportive, but I have um, come to the conclusion that it is about as um, as good as we were able to get it, and um, and I'm comfortable voting in favor of it. And so I want to thank everybody for the time for this explanation, and I um, I encourage everybody to uh, join me with a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. We will also vote to approve application number C two one zero one zero nine H A K the new pen development one. This application was submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Charter Section 197C for designation of an urban development action area and approval of an urban development action area project and the disposition of city owned property located at 306 Pennsylvania Avenue, 392 and 426 Wyona Street and 467 Vermont Street in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn. These approvals will facilitate the development of three new buildings with 46 affordable rental units, eight of which it will be affordable independent residents for seniors, heirs units. We will also vote to approve application number 202-15019-HAK, the new Penn Development 2 UDAP. This application was submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law for approval of an urban development action area project and waiver of the area designation requirements in sections 197-C and 197-D of the New York City Charter for property located at 791 Saratoga Avenue, 792 Rockaway Avenue, 429 Newport Street, 303 Hinslet, Hinsdale Street, 461 New Jersey Avenue, 432 Wyona Street, and 510 Vermont Street, also in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn. This application will facilitate the construction of seven buildings containing a, a total of approximately 25 rental dwellings units, plus one unit for the superintendent. Both projects are located in Council District, represented by Council Member Barron. And I would like to allow Council Member Barron to give any remarks if she has any. Council Member Barron, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Riley. Uh, thank you for those who are here to participate in this hearing. I'm speaking on behalf of the project for my district. Uh, 
and I'm urging all of my colleagues to vote in the affirmative for this project. Just to summarize, you know, I'm always interested in the AMIs. I'm always interested in the designation for the people who live in my community, which has a neighborhood median income of about $38,000. Of course, we have a range above and below, but that's the medium for my neighborhood. So I just want to summarize for my colleagues what this plan does. There are a total of 71 units of housing affordable to the people who live in my community. And that's, that's uh, testified to by the fact that 10% of the units that are going to be in these developments are for formerly homeless people earning less than $23,000. Eight of the units are for seniors, designated for seniors. 15% of the units are designated for people at 30% or below of the AMI. 19% of the units for people earning 40% of the AMI. 10% of the units for people earning 50% of the AMI and 34 units for people earning 60% or less. So that means that I've got 81% of the total number of units coming into this into these developments for people who earn 60% or less of the AMI. So you ask, well, what's the other 19%? The other 19% is for people who are at 80% of the AMI. I know some of my colleagues think you got to have that market rate to balance it out, but this is a development and a project of which I'm extremely proud. And the community board is in favor, the borough president, is in favor of this project. And I ask that my colleagues vote in the affirmative. Uh, and these are a range of apartment sizes as well, ranging from studios to one, two, and three bedroom units. And those three bedroom units are also uh, appropriated for people who earn 60% and less of the AMI, which doesn't often happen. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for an opportunity to tout uh, the great accomplishments of planning for this development. I urge my colleagues to vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Any time, Council Member Barron. Council, please call the roll. Riley. Aye. Ku. Council Member Ku. I will aye. Council Member Traeger. Aye. Council Member Barron. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. I want to commend my colleague for his efforts in uh, land use 752 but I have not heard from the advocates that, they, that this satisfies their concerns about the air rights. So I will be voting no on that project with all due respect and voting aye on the others. Thank you. Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller. Uh, we can hold the vote open for council member M Miller. He appears to have stepped away, but as the vote stands, uh, we have for LU 752, three in the affirmative, one in the negative, zero abstentions. So that item is approved and recommended for approval to the full land use committee and for the new pen uh, developments. We are at four in the affirmative and uh, zero in the negative with zero abstentions. So, so that also is, rec those are also recommended to the full on use committee, but we will hold the vote open. We can proceed. Thank you. I recognize the council once again to explain today's hearing procedures. Thank you. I am Jeffrey Campania, counsel to the subcommittee. Uh, members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you registered to testify and are not yet signed into Zoom, please sign in now and remain signed in until after you have testified. 
If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you're not planning to testify on today's items, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have written testimony, you would like the subcommittee to consider or consider an addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number of pro or project name in the subject line of the email. Please, during the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. Uh, we ask that you be patient as we work through these issues. And Chair Riley, before we continue, I see that Council Member Miller is here. So with your permission, I'll take his vote on today's items. Council yes, Member go Miller. ahead, Council. Unmute here, okay. Good afternoon, Chair Riley. Uh, I, I vote aye. Thank you, King. Thank you. So that is four in the affirmative with one in the negative and zero abstentions for LU752 and five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions for the new pen developments. Thank you. I now open today's public hearing on application number 202-15001 HIK, the Landmark Preservation Commission designation of Harriet and Thomas Truesdale House located at 227 Duffield Street in Brooklyn as a historic landmark. This site is located in Council Member Levin's district and I would like to allow Council Member Levin to give any words uh, for this project if he has any. Council Member Levin. I'm sorry, Chair, this, uh, this is in, uh, um, in reference to which proposal, I'm sorry? Uh, this is referring to the landmark of the Harriet and oh, Thomas Choose oh, Their House. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I was uh, so consumed with the other one. Um, this is a. I mean, this is a very um, meaningful um, uh, action taken on the part of the city, and really, the the credit belongs to um, uh, the community that um, really rose up their voice in uh, seeking to landmark. Um, uh, the Truesdale House on Duffield Street, 227 Duffield, um, which um, uh, was very likely a spot on the Underground Railroad. Um, the building uh, is largely intact, though with some, some renovation uh, and additions over the years, but um, uh, is, is some of the most meaningful uh, 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 aspects of downtown or um, buildings in downtown Brooklyn that remain that remain there today and they remain intact. Um, downtown Brooklyn and Brooklyn as a whole um, had uh, a rich history um, with regard to the abolitionist movement um, and the Underground Railroad, um, and um, and this is a, a meaningful acknowledgement of that history. Um, but again, the community um, made this happen. Um, uh, and um, I want to thank um, um, a, a resident of downtown Brooklyn and a neighbor uh, or the owner of the building, um, uh, Mama Joy, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, but was um, had been advocating for this landmark status um, for many, many years. Um, uh, and, um, and, and sadly, she passed away. But this is a um, a, really, a testament to the work that she did on, on really making sure that the public knew uh, the history of this building. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Raul Rothblatt, who uh, worked with with Mama Joy um, uh, for many years on this and kept and kept the fight alive. Um, and I also want to especially acknowledge to hear more from the mayor's office. It's no longer with the mayor's office, but 
um, uh, uh, I think put in a lot of effort and work um, uh, at City Hall, um, making sure that the mayor and his staff uh, saw the importance of this. And, and, and then lastly, of course, the, the Landmarks Commission for, uh, for working with the community. But, um, but it's a, this is a very uh, great and important um, a designation and, and I thank everybody for the time. Thank you, thank you, Chair Riley. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for LPC is Kate Lemos McHale and Anthony Fabre. Council, please administer the affirmation. Is Anthony here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Great. Uh, please raise your right hands and state your names one at a time. Uh, Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and you may begin. Uh, thank you, Chair Riley. Uh, I'm Kate Lemus McHale, the Director of Research at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, thank you to the subcommittee and Council Member Levin uh, for the opportunity to present the Harriet and Thomas Truesdale House and for your words, Council Member Levin. Um, it was designated on February 2nd, 2021 as an individual landmark. And hopefully there's a presentation for you. Great, thank you. And can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. For more than a decade prior to the Civil War, 227 Duffield Street was the home of Thomas and Harriet Truesdale notable abolitionists who had moved to Brooklyn in 1839. They owned and lived in this house from 1851 to 1863, and the property remained in their family until 1921, a period of 70 years. While a two-story commercial extension was added in 1933, the house retains its 19th century form and historic fabric that are visible above that addition. The Row House is significant for its association with the Truesdells and the history of the abolition movement in Brooklyn prior to the Civil War. At the public hearing at July, of July 14th, 2020, 44 people testified in favor of the proposed designation, including New York State Attorney General Letitia James, City Council Members Stephen Levin and Inez Barron, State Assembly Members Charles Barron and Representative of Joanne Simon, uh, New York City's first deputy public advocate, Nick Smith, and Community Board 3. Advocates and organizations, including the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Historic Districts Council, the Society for the Architecture of the City, Black Lives Matter Brooklyn, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality, or FURY, and Equity for Flatbush, and several individuals. A representative of the owner of 227 Duffield Street testified in opposition to the designation. In addition, the commission received 85 letters of support for designation. Next slide, please. This map shows the location um, of block 146, lot 15 between Fulton Street and Willoughby Street on Duffield Street in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, next, please. To give you some background, LPC research staff carefully studied 227 Duffield Street and the Truesdells within the historic context of 19th century abolitionism. This timeline developed for our interactive story map, New York City and a Path to Freedom, shows some of the milestones leading to the abolition of slavery nationwide in 1865. In the early 19th century, Brooklyn's economy relied heavily on the storage and export of agricultural products shipped from Southern slaveholding states. Yet its waterfront and large population of free African-Americans made it a hub for abolitionist activity. Its busy waterfront was the entry point for many freedom seekers um, who were sheltered by Brooklyn abolitionists participating in underground railroad networks and either stayed in Brooklyn or traveled north to upstate New York or New England and many went on to Canada. Uh, next, please. 
Abolitionist activity took many forms, including membership in anti-slavery organizations, political activism, fundraising, lecturing, writing, and publishing. It involved people from many walks of life and across social, religious, and racial spectrums. Brooklyn was home to many who opposed slavery, and several prominent individuals associated with the abolition movement lived or worked in buildings within the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, for example. Henry Ward Beecher, shown here, was a minister at Plymouth Church who drew large crowds with his fiery sermons. Um, James W.C. Pennington came to Brooklyn escaping slavery and became an influential minister and writer. And Lewis Tappan was a businessman who worked tirelessly to abolish slavery and founded um, the journal Human Rights. Uh, next, please. Several individual landmarks and historic districts in Brooklyn reflect its abolitionist history. The designated houses on Hunterfly Road in Weeksville, for example, embody the history of an early African-American community that was a safe haven for free and enslaved African-Americans. The Brooklyn Heights Historic District includes homes and churches associated with the anti-slavery movement. The most notable being Plymouth Church, referred to as the Grand Central Depot of the Underground Railroad. Closer to Duffield Street is the first free congregational church on Bridge Street, an individual landmark that was also an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Documenting Underground Railroad activity is difficult given its secret and clandestine nature. Recent verbal accounts of 227 Duffield Street being a stop on the Underground Railroad have not been confirmed after extensive research and physical analysis. Nevertheless, the building is historically significant as tied to this important history of the abolition movement um, and this important leg legacy associated with the Truesdells who were active supporters of the anti-slavery movement during their time at 227 Duffield Street. Uh, next, please. Before moving to New York City um, from Providence, Rhode Island, both Thomas and Harriet Truesdell were active abolitionists. They were among the founders of several anti-slavery organizations including the Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society, the New England Anti-Slavery Society, and the Providence Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. As dedicated supporters of the New England Anti-Slavery Movement, the Truesdells were friends of William Lloyd Garrison, who's shown here, one of the country's leading abolitionists who championed women's rights as well. Uh, next slide, please. In 1838, Thomas and Harriet left Providence and moved his export and import firm to Pearl Street in Manhattan. While maintaining his business in the city, they lived in Brooklyn, first at 14 Hicks Street in Brooklyn Heights. Um, that's shown here with the orange arrow. Garrison's papers include letters documenting a number of visits to the Truesdells in New York, including a trip in 1840 to their Brooklyn row house. Um, that house was later demolished for the construction of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Uh, next, please. They moved to 227 Duffield Street in 1851, shortly after the three-story brick, brick row house was built. The neighborhood at that time consisted of rows of both wood and brick residences, most with front and rear porches and basements as seen in the 1855 Paris map on the left. 227 Duffield Street still had its front porch in place in 1907 as as shown in this photo below the red arrow. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, the neighborhood gradually began to change from residential into Brooklyn's downtown retail and commercial center as shown in the Sanborn map on the right. Next slide, please. The Truesdells continued to support the abolition movement during the time they lived at 227 Duffield Street. Records show Thomas Truesdell was associated with the American Anti-Slavery Society from 1853 to 63 and supported the National Anti-Slavery Standard during this time as well. The New York Daily Times noted that Thomas and his family were among the quote, notable men in the audience at a large anti-slavery event held in August, 1855. The celebration marked the anniversary of emancipation in the West Indies and included a speech by William Lloyd Garrison. Harriet died in 1862 while living at 227 Duffield Street and Thomas moved to New Jersey the next year. Descendants of their family retained the house until 1921, resulting in the family's 70 year association with the property. Uh, next please. Since its time associated with the Truesdells, the house's front and rear porches were removed 
and in 1933, a two-story commercial addition was constructed, extending from the front of the building. A certificate of occupancy from 1933 lists a store and luncheonette within the first two floors with apartments above. The original 1850s facade above the commercial extension remains visible with its fenestration pattern, window surrounds, um, red brick cladding and cornice. And next slide, please. Thanks. The Harriet and Thomas Truesdell house is significant as a rare example of a property associated with documented notable abolitionists who resided there for more than a decade and whose anti-slavery activities have been well documented. Um, while its neighborhood has changed dramatically and its lower stories have been altered, the building conveys its 19th century residential character and its significant association with Brooklyn's prominent role in the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. The Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, recommends the city council vote to uphold this important designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I do not have any questions uh, for this applicant panel. I'm not sure if Council Member uh, Levin has any questions. Um, I don't. I don't chair. I just want to again thank uh, LPC, um, Kate, and um, and Chair Carroll and their staff for. Um, for working diligently to to make this a reality and and. Uh, just want to express my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do understand council member Barron, do you have any questions? Yeah. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you council member Barron. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Riley. Uh, this is an extremely important designation and victory this has been almost 20 years in the make, no, not that long, started in 2004 uh, in the making for this to occur. So the history that was presented by the panel gives you the background of what it was that we had to fight and struggle for. And this project, this designation of uh, Duffield Street is important. They wanted to raise this building, they being the city. They wanted to take it by eminent domain and include it in their 2004 downtown Brooklyn development plan of Albee Square. And as has been cited, it was the work as council member Levin has said of the activists of Joy Chattel, whom we call Mama Joy, who passed away a few years ago and Fury Families United for Racist and Economic Justice and activists and dedicated council members, one of whom will speak a little bit later after me, to fight to keep this significant part of our history from being demolished, erased, and done away with. So in 2005, uh, the LPC, or maybe 2007, the Landmarks uh, Preservation Committee, whom today is advocating for this landmark status at that time did not vote to support the preservation. So that was one battle that we had. Bloomberg came up with an offer of $2 million for a group to study how in fact the uh, accomplishments could be noted, but that was just a ploy to try to distract people, but people were not distracted. There was a study done by the, uh, probably the EDC that hired, uh, AKRF to do a report and find out what happened. That report was so fraudulent because it was seeking to support the eminent domain takeover. Uh, it was fraudulent. It did not have accurate information. It made allegations that they had contacted and consulted with uh, historians at the Schomburg, which had not happened. But there was an attack on that report, which basically destroyed its credibility. Again, we continue the fight, continue the battle. And uh, as has been heard in March of 2021, the Landmarks Preservation Commission did in fact 
bought this as a landmark and the city now has ownership of this land. So we're excited to know that it's going to be protected and going to move forward. And shall I wait for you, uh, Ms. Campagna, to call the next panelist or shall he just come over? Jeff, Ms. Well, Campagna. I, I think we're gonna call him um, next up, uh, council member. We wanna okay. give him a, a special introduction. Okay, uh, great, just, thank I just you. I wanted to thank you, um, your husband, uh, Assembly Member Barron, uh, Council Member Levin, um, all the advocates, um, Mama Joy, uh, God rest her soul for, for advocating and keeping this um, you know, monumental uh, location within our Great. community. So thank you so much. Thank um, you, I, he's gonna come right here. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think we have any questions from any colleagues, uh, Council Dewey. <laughs> Uh, Council Member Miller, do you have any questions? Council Member Miller, can you? I'm trying to yeah, go. No, I, I don't have any uh, questions, but I, I just want to uh, reaffirm and, and reiterate what, what Council Member Barron just said and, and say to LPC that, that this is the work, that we finally got it right here. And, and that's, this is why that why why they forget it. No, they're asking if you have any questions. I'm I'm speaking. I'm sorry. So this is this is the work. This is this is really the work and, and, and I thank you. I thank all for their, their steadfast advocacy because these things don't happen as we see overnight and those who came before us that, that really put in the work as you said, you know, I uh, want to thank them for their efforts as well. So without further ado, okay. you can pass it on to someone who I'm sure was on the front line just a little ways back. Hey, my brother. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm near perfect, man. Thank God. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Councilmember Miller. And if there are no other council members with any questions, I would like to excuse uh, this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Assembly member Charles Barron would like to testify on this item. <laughs> Welcome assembly member Charles Barron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. It is indeed an honor to be before you. It has been a long struggle and I think people laid that out, particularly Mama Chattel, Joy Chattel's role in it. And we had to stop it at the land use. They were trying to rush it through uh, with a vote of 15 to zero, but uh, assembly member or council member Al Van and Letitia James and myself said, no, we want a, a right study done and do it the right way. <laughs> but let me not just rehearse the history because people did that already. But I think most of you may know that New York City was one of the largest slaveholding cities in the union. It was only uh, second to South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. In 1827, when New York City abolished slavery, they did that because Africans rose up and resisted. Africans rose up and resisted the enslavement. As a matter of fact, in 1712, they burnt down a lot of the slave so-called masters or slaveholders' uh, property. And while they were killed for that, they didn't stop. They came back again, even burnt down the governor's mansion. And by 1799, they had some uh, gradual emancipation act. They said in 27 years or 28 years, they would free uh, all of those who were born that year in 28 years. And if you were a girl, you were freed in 25 years, the gradual emancipation act. So in slavery was was big in New York City. And they used to, through some of the ports, import cotton and all of that stuff from the South. And this is why by 1850, they had a, the Fugitive Slave Act because the South was saying, in those boats that they trading with y'all up there, a lot of Africans are escaping. And this is how and why NYPD came into existence in 1845 as slave catchers, quote, slave catchers. They're still running around here thinking we're slaves trying to catch and kill us still. But 
this is how they came into existence. So when we speak of Duffield, we're not just talking about some building and some little museum and some history. We're talking about a very live history, a history that's very much alive. And that's why we fought so hard to reserve it because history gives a people its time, its clock. History is not just about personalities and dates. History shows us what's possible, what can be done. And when we tell that story of what can be done by those who were worse off than us, then there's no reason for us not to do much better now when we get in these seats of power. We owe it to our ancestors to make sure we don't pass budgets that are not really eradicating poverty, that we don't pass budgets that, or development projects that gentrify our neighborhoods, that we don't give more money to the slave catching police. We got to make sure that we honor our ancestors and do the right thing by their image so that we can survive as a people in the 21st century here. And this is why Duffield is so important. It's not just a, a landmarking, some naming thing so we can have some cultural feel good. This is about liberation the liberation of a people, African people in New York City. And that's why this is so timely. And I commend you for doing this and we should build further on it so that we can bring real meaning to this day. I thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Barron, for your testimony and dedicated service to our community for many, many years. We truly, truly appreciate you, King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council, are there any more public testimonies? If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify, please raise your hand now. I see no other members of the public uh, registered to testify. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application number 202-15001 HIK, the Landmark Preservation Commission designation of the Harry and Thomas Truesdale House is now closed and the item is laid over. Next, I open up the public hearing on application number 202-10195-HAX, the 97, 97 West 169th Street project. This is an application submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and the development re requesting the designation of property located at 97 West 169th Street, block 2519, lots 27 and 32 as an urban development action area as well as an approval of an urban development action area project for such area and disposition of such property to a developer to be selected by HPD. These actions will facilitate the development of a nine story building containing approximately 104 affordable housing units and the community facility space. This project is located in the Bronx Council District represented by Councilmember Gibson, and I would like to allow Councilmember Gibson a chance to give any remarks regarding this project. Councilmember Gibson, you may have the floor. Thank you so much, Chair Kevin Riley, and good afternoon, colleagues and members of the public on the subcommittee. It's really a great honor to join with you this afternoon. I am proud to speak up in support of the designated application as described by Chair Riley. You learned now number C210195HAX. This project is known in our community as Corporal Fisher Park at 97 West 169th Street, and it is submitted by HPD. Um, and we are very proud of the work uh, that is being proposed by Wishfish, which is also known as Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. Um, for over 40 years, Wishfish has been a wonderful partner with the city of New York, with the city council. Uh, although I've not known them all 40 years, I've known them for over 10 years in my time in the council and previously in the state assembly. And I've always found them to be engaging and truly committed to affordable and supportive housing 
on behalf of residents and families, and in particular, older residents, our seniors who have done so much for us. This particular development in um, question is located in the Highbridge community of my district at 169th Street and Shakespeare Avenue, right off of Edward L. Grant Highway. And it will offer about 15,000 square feet of affordable housing for our older residents. And I'm really grateful when you talk about affordable housing and real affordable housing and opportunities that we must provide for our seniors, this project is exactly it. It will provide uh, significant investments um, of not just affordable housing, but all of the amenities that we truly know our seniors need. There will be a combination of one bedroom apartments, studios, as well as a homeless set aside for seniors who are coming directly from homeless shelters. Uh, there will be an FQHC, our federally qualified health center operated by Damien Family Healthcare. And we will also have a mixed use building that will have all of the amenities, outdoor space for many of our seniors that are aging in place. Um, I think when you look at the opportunities that we have in the Bronx, uh, we have not seen a lot of development happening across the Highbridge area. We've opened the Highbridge Middle School. We are transforming Corporal Fisher Park, which is $4.6 million. And just across the street, we are going to see a brand new school for 455 elementary school students in school district nine. This is an area uh, that has long been uh, under um, under invested in and short changed over the years. Highbridge has lost a lot. And a lot of times they are only known for the proximity to Yankee Stadium, but it's much more than that. Highbridge is a beautiful community of culture, of diversity. Um, Highbridge Gardens, the Highbridge neighborhood, Nelson Park, Shakespeare Playground, Plimpton. I'm really excited at what value bring to the Highbridge community. And we have been working closely with Bronx Community Board 4, the Borough President's Office, the Jerome Avenue Collaborative uh, Partnership. We've been doing a lot on the ground and we, we wish fish know of a lot of the concerns that we've had about seniors and their needs. Uh, mental health, therapeutic services, wraparound services, all critical components of what many of our older residents need at such a time as this. Uh, and so I'm grateful. Uh, this is a project that I think will have a lot of value. It will bring a uh, beautification to our community of Highbridge, um, and it really will make a significant contribution. And while I wish it could be more than 104 units, um, I'll start someplace. Um, and I certainly want to recognize my colleagues in the state legislature, our Senator Jose Serrano and our Assemblymember Latoya Joyner, who also played a role in allowing this project to happen because we did need the authority uh, and the approval from the state legislature to build on this uh, designated parkland. So with that, I'm grateful for Wishfish. Thank you, HPD. Thank you, Chair Riley. And I look forward to this project moving through the process here in the subcommittee, land use and the city council. Thank you so much for your time today. And thanks again, Chair Riley. Thanks again, Queen. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Libby Rolfing, Paul Freitag, Jennifer Steinberg, and Nicole Vlado. Council, please administer the affirmation. Before I do that, uh, just I want to ask Libby, is, is that the presenter panel? Do I have that right? Is it, that is right. There was there was one under individual for questions, Anna Driscoll, but I think we can go ahead if if okay. she's not, we, we can call her you, on if, if she, we the need four to. of you can I'm state here. your names Are one you at here? a time. Okay. If the four of you can state your names one at a time. Sure. Libby Rolfing, Chief of Staff for the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Paul Freitag, Executive Director of the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. Jennifer Steinberg, Director of Real Estate Development, West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. Nicole Vlado, principal of Shakespeare Gordon Vlado Architects. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affirmation again for the record, and then you may begin. 
Great, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Rolfing. I'm the Chief of Staff for the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. Thanks for the opportunity to testify um, today on this project. Um, this land use item consists of a ULERB action seeking UDAP designation and UDAP approval and disposition for a project known as Fisher Senior Apartments to be developed on two vacant city-owned lots located at 97 West 169th Street, Block 2519, Lots 27 and 32, which we'll, we will refer to here as the development site, in the hybrid, sec hybrid section of Bronx Council District 16. In connection with the 2008 Jerome Avenue rezoning, the Jerome Avenue points of agreement identified the development site as the location for senior affordable housing. The development site was formerly mapped as parkland to be part of the planned Corporal Fisher Park, but sat unimproved for decades. To facilitate this commitment, in 2017, the New York State Legislature authorized the city to discontinue the site's use as parkland and convey it for the purpose of affordable housing. An adjoining DMAP street was added to the remaining portion of Corporal Fisher Park, which will be developed as a public park. The sponsors were selected through a competitive RFP process and their proposal is to construct one residential building with a total of 104 units and one unit for the superintendent under HPD's Senior Affordable Housing Program or the SARA program. Under the SARA program, HPD provides gap financing in the form of low interest loans to support the construction and renovation of affordable housing for low income seniors. Rents will be restricted at 60% of area median income, but tenants with rental assistance will pay up to 30% of their income and this project will have 100% rental assistance. Projects developed with SARA funding must also set aside 30% of units for homeless seniors referred by a city or state agency, typically the New York City Department of Homeless Services. Under the proposed project, the city will sell the disposition area to Fisher Senior Apartments Housing Development Fund Company, Inc. The proposed project will be a new approximately nine story residential building with two elevators. In addition to the affordable housing, the building will include community facility space to be occupied by a federally qualified health center. The building's top two floors will be devoted to providing approximately 22 enhanced care studio units. Each enhanced care floor will include a communal dining room, kitchen and lounge area with additional staff to offer additional support services for residents needing a higher level of care. The building will include approximately 2,842 square feet of recreational space in compliance with the AIRS program, a landscape terrace, and a rear yard that will be accessible to residents. A laundry room, a front desk, common areas, and social services will also be available to residents. Sustainability features of the proposed development include green walls with native plantings, passive solar shading, and energy efficient windows and lighting. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the Fisher Senior Apartments SARA project in order to facilitate construction of this affordable senior residential building. And with that, I would uh, love to turn it over to Paul, Paul Freitag from Wishfish for their presentation. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we should have a slide presentation with us. Great, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for, um, for uh, listening to our proposal here, our presentation. Um, so we're here to present a uh, proposed affordable senior uh, project located at 97 West 169th Street. Okay, the next slide, please. So just to quickly give a background about Wistfish. Wistfish is a large not-for-profit. We've been around for 45 years and we specialize in doing affordable senior housing. Um, I think our unique quality is that we actually do all aspects of, um, of the work in our buildings. We develop them ourselves, we own and provide all property management. And then most importantly, we also provide all the social services to the residents in our buildings. Um, we feel that the fact that we you know, have such a comprehensive uh, approach to our buildings allows us to really serve our residents in a way that addresses all of their needs. Um, at this point, we have 31 buildings and we have approximately 2,500 units of affordable housing. Um, Wistfish is unique in that although we're a large not-for-profit, we do not uh, work citywide. 
We are focused particularly in two different areas. One is on the west side of Manhattan and, um, and Harlem, and then also in the Bronx. Uh, many of our most recent projects have been in the Bronx. At this point, we have 800 units of senior affordable housing located in the Bronx. The other thing that I think is unique about our projects is that as we develop them, we always look to see what contribution we can make to the neighborhoods in which our projects are located. Um, this usually takes the form in some type of community-oriented retail or else a community facility, um, which we'll talk more about later on in this presentation. The other thing that really, we really focus on is job creation. Um, and in this particular project, we are already speaking with the Drome Avenue Revitalization Collaborative in order to have them assist us with local recruitment, hiring, and training. Um, at this point, throughout our portfolio, Wispfish has close to 500 employees. And one of the things that we do in our recruiting is that we don't um, focus just on the jobs that will be available in the building in that particular neighborhood, but we actually open up all our recruiting to buildings throughout our portfolio, which gives many more opportunities for people to you know, work within our buildings. Um, all of our projects, we always hold a neighborhood job fair as the project is finishing construction and moving towards operations. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So this is just to quickly show um, our broad uh, portfolio of buildings. The ones that are um, not grayed out, but are actually in full color are our projects that are located in the Bronx. Um, in particular, on the bottom row is our project called the Claremont, uh, which is located also in Community Board 4, uh, quite close to this proposed project. Um, could I have the next slide, please? And I wanted to focus in particular on two of our most recent projects in the Bronx. This is a project that consists of um, a, a building that we owned and operated for a number of years called Brink and Court. And then we developed two new buildings on either side of the existing building to create a campus of 320 affordable senior apartments, which are all linked on the inside. Uh, this campus also features an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, and a, a DIPTA funded senior center. Um, that provides um, uh, senior services, not just for our residents, but for the local community. Um, I wanted to show this picture in particular to highlight the you know, architectural detail that we um, pride in our buildings, both on the exteriors and the interiors. And the architect for our Fisher uh, senior housing project is the same architect who did this building. Uh, next slide, please. And then what is probably most important in our buildings is the attention that we pay to the social services that we provide. Um, our services include multilingual case management, counseling and crisis intervention. Um, but then at the same time, we also are providing recreation and social activities, transportation assistance. And we also, in a number of our buildings now, actually also provide meals to make sure that our the residents you know, meet all their nutrition requirements. Probably what we spend the most time on is helping keep our residents healthy. And so part of the services we provide are medication supervision and healthcare coordination. And this is one of the reasons that we're very interested in locating federally qualified health centers in our buildings to help with this effort to keep our residents as healthy as possible. Um, next slide, please. And I will now hand it over to uh, Jennifer Steinberg to talk a little bit more about this specific project. I think she'll need to be unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so we have a map here with the red pin at 97 West 169th Street between Shakespeare and Nelson Avenues, just to give you a sense of where we are. Next slide, please. i to talk a little bit more about the building itself. We're going to have 105 units uh, of senior housing. We'll have 59 one bedrooms, 45 studios, and one two bedroom superintendent units. All units are going to receive project based Section 8 vouchers, which means tenants only pay 30% of their income towards rent. We'll take households whose area median income is anywhere from zero to 50% AMI, uh, which you could see the current AMI levels on the screen. Next slide, please. 
And all units, as I mentioned, this is a senior building. So all units are gonna be reserved for households 62 and over. Uh, as in accordance with the HPD term sheet, we will have 30% formerly homeless seniors. Uh, the amenities that we have for all tenants are, are amenities that we have uh, in the majority of our buildings. We have on-site management provided by Westfish, on-site social services also provided by Westfish, indoor and outdoor recreation spaces for everyone. We have 24 seven front desk staff, which is again, it's not an outside contractor, but provided by Wispish and is really a member of our team. Uh, we'll have a tenant laundry room and the federally qualified health center on premise, which I'll talk about more in a second. Uh, the enhanced care pilot that Libby mentioned earlier is a pilot program on the top two floors of the building that encourage uh, aging in place for our seniors. Uh, this grow out of a uh, need that we saw in a lot of our building to really fill a gap in services between uh, our independent living situations as well as our nursing homes. And we thought this was a perfect opportunity to pilot that model. Next slide, please. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, we're gonna have a federally qualified health center run by Damien Family Care Centers at our site. This will be the fourth building where we have an FQHC on site. We have pictures of three of our buildings um, at 108th Street in Manhattan, the Tres Puentes building that Paul mentioned earlier and our grandparents' family apartments uh, in the Bronx that all have uh, some form of FQHC that, that will be on site that we really think is gonna be a huge benefit both to our residents as well as the community. Uh, a feature of the FQHC is that they serve anyone with Medicaid and Medicare. So there's really not a limit um, for who they can serve, which is really wonderful. Uh, we believe that Damien will provide primary geriatric, dental and specialist care, and will work in collaboration with the WISFISH team to provide um, specialized support for our residents. Next slide, please. And here is another view of the site and I'll turn it over to our architect, Nicole Flato, to talk further about it. I believe she is also on mute and will need to be unmuted by the hosts. Thanks, Jen. Um, so here we have, again, as Jen mentioned, our site in the hybrid section of the Bronx, um, which as was mentioned earlier, a very eclectic, neighborhood with a range of building types and heights and styles. So this is just showing the form of our building within its context. Can we take the next slide, please? And here are some images again of the area, uh, specifically of the site itself, uh, views up and down the street. Next slide. And we took inspiration for the building's form and its facade from historic buildings in the Bronx and other parts of Manhattan. Um, so you'll see here some reference to masonry detailing, including brick corbeling and use of color that comes into play in our building as well. Next slide. And here we see our 15,000 square foot project site, which is a slightly regularly shaped, um, located mid block again on 169th Street between Nelson and Shakespeare Avenues. We are proposing an as of right um, design proposal here for the R71 district. And so we are able to have a 75 foot or seven story base uh, after which there's a setback. And then the overall building height is 95 feet or nine stories. And we are showing here our rear yard design and the building, uh, a feature of the site is that there is a rock outcropping that the design works to around to sort of minimize disruption to that that feature. Next slide. Here's the first floor plan, which shows our 2,500 square foot clinic on the left-hand side of the site, which has its own street entrance and the designs for that clinic are underway. Um, the residential entrance is to the right, so further down on the street, um, which uh, enters into the lobby. And we have a reception desk, which, was, uh, which will be staffed with 24 seven uh, front desk staff. Uh, there are other amenities on this floor, which include the social services and building management offices, as well as common spaces available for the tenants at both the front and the rear of the site. 
um, which connect directly to the rear yard space. Uh, this is a fully accessible site. And even though we have um, some, um, uh, say a difference between the height of the rear yard, we're managing that through ramps as well as stairs. So a fully accessible access to the ground floor and throughout the building. Next slide, please. This shows our typical floor with a combination of studios and one bedrooms, uh, as well as light filled corridor. Next slide. And then we have our enhanced care level here, uh, which is the floor plan for the eighth and ninth stories, which are our studios, which each have their own um, kitchenettes and bathrooms and are also enhanced by uh, the common lounge kitchens uh, in the shared space there. And on the eighth floor, there's also access uh, for all tenants in the building to the landscape terrace. Next slide, please. As was mentioned earlier, this building will be designed to conform to the 2020 um, criteria for enterprise green communities and will be designed to be solar ready. Next slide. And here's a view of the proposed design. This is looking um, towards Nelson Avenue from Shakespeare. So you can see the design is an effort to reduce the appearance of the bulk. Um, and introduce some color and masonry details as we described earlier. And we see some of the uh, landscape elements at the front of the building as well. Next slide. Again, a view from across the street, seeing both the clinic and the distinct residential entrances of the building, um, as well as the landscape features that are both an amenity for passersby on the street and for the residents uh, and visitors of the building as well. Next slide. And this is a detail that shows the corbeling um, that will introduce uh, color to the facade, again, picking up from the Art Deco precedents that we shared um, images of earlier, which we think really enhance the street and create a beautiful building. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the end of the presentation? Yes, it is. All right. So, so we have. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have. One, we have one more slide. <laughs> we just wanted to show you where we stood right now, uh, which is obviously at your city council review today. We have already uh, gotten the CB4, the Bronx VP, and the city uh, planning commission approvals. Uh, we hope to have uh, the city council and mayoral approval by June, which will allow us to have our construction finance closing in August uh, and our construction completion in um, September of 2023, uh, which is when we'd start Lisa. So uh, thank you very much for your time and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, so just a few questions. Uh, you have indicated plans to develop the site under the HPD SARAS program. Uh, can you please provide a sense of where this project stands in the pre-development process? When do you expect to close on HPD financing? When do you expect to secure all agency approvals needed to begin construction on this development? And lastly, how long do you expect construction to last on this project? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, so we, uh, we anticipate receiving all agency approvals uh, by August 2021, which would allow us to close on construction financing then. Uh, the construction we hope to take 22 to 24 months, which puts us at September 2023 um, for a uh, getting our TCO, which allows us to lease up the building uh, to potential tenants. Thank you. Can you detail how the approximately 32 units of housing designated for formerly homeless families will source the residents for these units? And will there be any efforts to establish community preference for these units? Sure. Uh, the homeless units will be from the New York City um, DHS uh, and HRA. 
Uh, we will have a service subsidy through New York 1515 to support those units. And we have, this is one of our, we've had four buildings recently that have gone through this process and uh, most of them, many of them have done it before. So we're very, very familiar with that. Uh, with that part of the process. There will not be um, a community preference for these particular units. And can you speak a bit more as to your partnership with Jerome Avenue Revitali Revitalization uh, Collaborative and your commitment to hire locally on this project? Will the local hire commitment be for jobs created during projects construction or for permanent jobs in the buildings or both? Sure, happy to talk about that. Uh, we were actually connected to JARC through uh, the district manager of Community Bird 4, who recommended that we speak to them um, to talk about job training and uh, providing uh, assistance with that. We will both work with them on the construction as well as the permanent jobs. The construction will be hired not by WISFISH, but through our um, general contractor, Proceeded Construction who we've worked with before on um, projects that have had NYCHA section three hiring, so local hiring requirements. So they've done that quite well in the past. And we look forward to working with JARC to see if they can help us uh, provide local hires for our, um, for our permanent hires as well. Uh, in terms of the commitment for local hiring, uh, we will have uh, the, higher NYC program and we will have MWBE um, targets that we uh, that are set by HPD, which we will strive to meet. Thank you. Um, I just want to yield my time. Does council member Gibson, do you have any questions for this applicant panel? No, Chair, I'm good. Thank you so much for your questions. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Um, I recognize Councilmember Barron has her hand raised. Councilmember Barron, do you want to ask your questions now? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I want to commend my colleague, Councilmember Gibson, for this project. Its description is one that's very appealing to me. Uh, everyone knows my position on providing housing to those who are have the greatest need and who are the most uh, oppressed and the most difficult in trying to find housing. So I commend you, Councilmember Gibson, for this project. And I just want to ask a question. I heard in the testimony that 50%, no, that this is a project designed for those who are at 50% of the AMI who were formerly homeless. Is that correct? Uh, everybody in the project will be under 50% of AMI. Uh, on top of that, 30% of the project will be reserved for formerly homeless. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I would just ask, is there any consideration to setting targets or s establishing income bans? Uh, uh, it has been found in the past that when there are not income bans that are established, there tends to be a bunching at the 50% of the AMI and not much uh, designated for those who are 10, 20, 30, whatever. So I would ask, do you plan to have targets for the various income bands that are below 50% of the AMI? Yeah, sure, I'm happy, happy. go ahead. Go ahead. So the, the beauty of this project is that every single apartment will have project-based section eight. So right. literally your income could be zero and you could move into this building. And so as we move people in, we actually, you know, as long as they are not over income, they're qualified to live here. And our priority is given in terms of order of application. And, you know, it doesn't have to do with grouping them anywhere within the income bands below 50%. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, just one more question. Can you guys uh, detail what the advanced care consists of on the advanced care floor for me real quick? So I will try. We have somebody in the waiting room who's a real expert on this. So we could defer to her if I, if I don't answer this question properly. But what we would do is we would provide um, essentially the equivalent of home health care attendants who would be there 24 seven. 
So the idea is that they would, as part, in addition to whatever care that they themselves, the individuals can contract for, we would have, you know, WISPish staff that would be there to provide any support that they need. You know, it's not medical care, but it's, you know, all other aspects in terms of being able to live independently. So we can guarantee that there will always be someone there 24 seven. Yes, that's the plan. Sure. Okay, great, okay. I don't think there's any more questions from my colleagues. So if there's no more questions, uh, this panel is excused. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Council, are there members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application number 202-10195-HAX, the 97 West 169th Street project is now closed and the item is laid over. Our last public hearing today will be on two applications submitted by HPD requested amendments to the Sindora Verde project approved by the council in 2017 in the connection with the East Harlem rezoning. We will hear application number 202-15020 HAM which requests approval of an urban development action area project to amend the UDAP previously approved in the resolution 1746 for the year 2017. We will also hear application number 202-15021 HAM, which requests approval of an amendment to an article 11 tax exemption approved in resolution 1735 for the year 2017. If approved, these applications will facilitate phase two of the Sendero Verde project located at block 1617, lots 20, 120, 125, and 140 in the Manhattan Council District represented by Council Member Ayala. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for this, these items is Libby Rolfing, Ariel Goldberg, and Philippe Cortez and Sabrina Barker on behalf of the developer. And again, I would ask uh, Libby Rolfing, do we have the pre presenter panel here? I was looking at somebody. I, I was being moved over while you were speaking. So I'm just checking really quickly. It looks like everyone seems to be here. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Council, please administer the affirmation. Again, please state your names one at a time and then raise your right hands. Elizabeth Rolfing. Felipe Cortez. Ariel Goldberg. Sabrina Barker. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all uh, uh, council member questions? Yes. I do. Yes. yes. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and then you may begin. Great. Thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth Rolfing. I'm the Chief of Staff with the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, and thank you for the opportunity to testify um, on this project here today. Um, so this land use item consists of an amendment to the Sendero Verde UDAP project that was previously approved for three formerly city-owned vacant lots located at block 1617, lots 20, 125, and 140, and one city-owned vacant lot located at block 1617, lot 120, in Council District 8 in Manhattan. The parcels re received disposition, urban development action area, and urban development action area project approvals concurrent with the East Harlem rezoning on November 30th, 2017. The previously approved UDAP project for the Sendero Verde affordable housing development included approximately 652 dwelling units plus three super units, approximately 36,218 square feet of commercial space, and approximately 161,440 square feet of community facility space. 
the proposed amended UDAP project for the Sendero Verde affordable housing development will include approximately 707 dwelling units plus two super units, approximately 6,213 square feet of commercial space and approximately 87,278 square feet of community facility space. Prior to financial closing on the first phase of Sendero Verde, the project's charter school partner changed and the new partner was not able to lease the entire community facility space. Thus, approximately 30,000 square feet, a community facility space was reconfigured into three residential floors of affordable housing in the first phase of Sendero Verde. This contributed to the increase in the total number of affordable housing units up to 707 units plus the two super units. Additionally, HPD also requests that the council amend the previously approved Article 11 tax exemption resolution for Sendero Verde A. On November 30th, 2017, the council also approved resolution number 1735, which authorized a tax exemption for block 1617, former lots 20, 51, 52, 53, 54, and part of lot 50, known as the exemption area, which became the majority of lot 120. Since the approval, the exemption area has expanded and now includes a part of former lot 23. As of September 28, 2018, all of the lots, including a part of former lot 23, have merged into current lot 120. In order to facilitate the project, the prior resolution must now be amended to include a part of former lot 23 to the exemption area and to add the New York City Housing Development Corporation as a party to the regulatory agreement. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of the proposed amended UDAP, UDAP and approval of the proposed Article 11 in order to facilitate construction of this next phase of the Sendero Verde affordable housing development. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to um, the development team, to Sabrina. Sorry, new problems. Um, great, I think we have a presentation. Pull that up. Um, and my name is Sabrina Barker. I'm from Jonathan Rose Companies. I'm a senior development um, manager on this deal. I've been working on it since 2017. So thank you so much for having us this afternoon to chat about the project and um, this post-approval uh, amendment. So if you go to the first slide, the next slide, um, this is just an overview. We'll talk a little bit more at the end of the presentation about the details of all of these items. Um, that would be detailed earlier, but basically the um, approved UDAP in 2017 had about 161,000 square feet of community facility. It currently has 87,000 in the, the current project. And our commercial facility space has also changed um, from 36,218 square feet to approximately 6,213. Um, we've also um, added um, affordable housing units from 655 to 709. Um, regarding the Article 11 tax abatement, we tried to put a handy um, diagram on the bottom, but the original Article 11 amendment um, was unintentionally omitted part of Lot 23, which you can see on the bottom. That um, area in red is where the Phase 2 is uh, going to be constructed. Um, so we'd like to correct that. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to give a quick overview of the project. Um, overall um, is a full block development in East Harlem between 111th and 112th and Park and Madison Avenues. Um, it was previously approved in 2017 and we started construction on the first phase um, in uh, July of 2019. So currently under construction, we have building B South, which in the image is a smaller building on the left. That includes 85 units of affordable housing and then base includes um, 12,000 square feet for Union Settlement, which was one of our community facility partners. Um, building B North includes 276 units of affordable housing, and the podium includes um, 50,000 square feet for Harlem Children's Zone, which is our current uh, charter school partner. Um, the first phase also includes um, four Green Thumb Community Gardens that used to exist on the site um, prior to the RFP and are being relocated on the southwest and southeast corner of the site. So you can see in the rendering that um, garden in the front is one of the future um, green thumb gardens. And then the center of the project um, has an 18,000 square foot publicly accessible uh, courtyard. Um, 
which is kind of the centerpiece of the project um, and will be publicly accessible uh, every single day of the year. And then the second phase is the tower in the back of the image. Um, that's phase two, which um, we're hoping to start construction on in July of this year. Next slide, please. Um, and so I just want to kind of talk about two of the main um, uh, two themes that really drove this project from the very beginning of design um, and, and through, you know, into um, actual development of the project. So the first um, concept for the development was this idea of creating a community of opportunity. So not just creating, you know, um, affordable housing, but also integrating all of the things that create um, a real community. So things like education, access to jobs, social services, um, and open space. And, um, you know, kind of layering all these um, services on site for both our residents and also the community at large. And I think we've spent a lot of time since the project started focused on bringing in really high quality community um, partners into the project to ensure that we uh, realize this vision. Next slide. And the second really exciting aspect of this project, um, originally it was um, the Sustain NYC RFP in 2016. And the idea behind that RFP was just, was um, how to create a passive house, um, affordable housing project. So passive house is a really stringent um, energy efficiency standard that was originally developed in Germany. And buildings that use passive house technologies um, use between 30 to 70% less energy for heating and cooling than a typical building. Um, so the entire residential portion of um, both phases will be certified to passive house standards. Um, and when it's completed um, together, it'll be the largest certified passive house in the country, which is pretty exciting. Um, another really nice thing about passive house is that it has, um, it's super insulated facade. We have triple glazed windows. Um, the ventilation air in the building is um, comes in through MERV 13 filters. So it has superior interior air quality um, for our residents. And, um, you know, we found in a lot of our projects in our portfolio that um, interior air quality you know, really helps with childhood asthma and other things. Um, the other sustainable feature, sustainability features of the project include um, our courtyard, which has um, native plantings and drought resistant plants, as well as um, efficient irrigation systems. And then obviously throughout the building, we're using low VOC um, products or no VOC products, um, energy efficient LED lights and um, all energy star appliances. Next slide. Can you advance to the next slide? Um, so this is our um, the affordability overview for the entire um, project for both phase one and phase two. On the left is phase one currently under construction. Um, all units are affordable to residents at 90% of AMI and below, um, including, you know, 10% for former homeless residents, 20% at 30% of AMI, and then kind of these um, smaller bands for 60%, 50%, and 40% of AMI. Um, phase two, we're expecting to finance that using the mix and match term sheet with HPD. So um, we have 15% formerly homeless all the way up to 40% at 90% of AMI. Um, so kind of a, a pretty wide range of different affordability bands. Uh, next slide. And this slide is just to show how the two phases relate to each other. So phase one is under construction currently. You can see that it um, includes building B North um, near 112th Street, uh, building B South, and then most of the publicly accessible open space in the uh, Green Thumb Community Garden. And then phase two is at the corner of um, Madison and East 112th, and will um, also complete a small portion of the courtyard. Next slide. And this is currently what it looks like uh, a couple of days ago. This it's under construction. So you can see we have the facade complete on building B South. 
and the facade is going up on um, uh, building B North. There's, uh, if you, there's a hole in the side of the building that's um, going to be a continuation of Harlem Children's Zone from the first phase to the second phase of the project. And then the area highlighted in yellow and shaded in green is going to be where phase two is constructed. Uh, next phase, next slide. And then just uh, to kind of focus a little bit on phase two, which is a project we're currently working on financing. We're expecting the financial closing closing to happen um, in June of 2021, so approximately 60 days from now. Um, and we'll start construction in July of this year. Um, it's a 34 story uh, tower, so it's the um, image in the back. Yep. Um, it has 348 units of affordable housing. On the base, we have a, a three story podium. The third floor is currently untenanted and we'll be you know, searching for the right community facility um, partner for that space, you know, in the next year or so. And then we also, the second floor is going to be leased uh, to Harlem Children's Zone, who's going to continue their fifth grade class in the second phase from the first phase. And then we're also leasing 2,500 square feet to our development partner, Acacia Network. Um, they're going to run an, a, like a community arts program off of the, the courtyard similar to the one that they, uh, they run in uh, Lower East Side and Lower East Side. So we're really excited about that. And then there's about 6,200 square feet of ground floor retail along Madison Avenue. And then we'll complete the public courtyard as part of the second phase. Next slide. And this is just a little bit more detail about AMI mix um, for phase two. So you can see um, a range of AMIs from formal and homeless to 90% of AMI. We have one super unit. Um, our residential amenities includes kind of like the basic things like bike storage and laundry room. We also have a large fitness center. We have a computer lounge that's kind of, um, it offers computers and also a printer. It also has desks for, um, you know, for homework study and a community library. Um, this rendering down below is of our community room, which includes, you know, a, a kitchenette where we can have um, nutrition classes and events, and then it also has a TV and um, space for um, events, um, and then we also have an outdoor terrace on the fourth floor. And I believe that is the end of the presentation. Oh. Sorry, end of the presentation on the phase two, sorry. <laughs> and then in more detail for what we're actually here for today, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the post, uh, post approval amendment. Um, as I mentioned, our community facility space, um, when we uh, first went before um, council in 2017, we hadn't started uh, schematic design yet on the project. And we had been speaking to a lot of community facility uh, partners on, on their space and we basically, I got approval for the largest spaces that um, our community partners would potentially want. Um, so a lot of that space we had originally uh, conceived of about 100,000 per square foot um, high school for, for Dream, um, the Dream High School. And unfortunately, they were, um, we were unable to lease that space to them uh, in, in 2019. Uh, they were unable to take that space. And they were you know, looking at, I think they opened other schools elsewhere. And so we ended up uh, in 2019 shrinking um, the podium of uh, phase one um, and partnering with Civic Builders, which is a, a great nonprofit that helped us kind of develop a, um, a spec charter school space for that phase and um, which we've now leased to Harlem Children's Zone. Uh, so that, re you know, kind of like that reduced the overall square footage quite a lot. Um, and then for the commercial square square footage, uh, we originally conceived of the second and third floor of uh, building A being uh, considered commercial square uh, per square feet. And as we've developed the project and as we've leased that second floor to uh, community facility users, uh, we have decided that that entire um, those two floors will just be leased to community facility users. So we've moved that 36,000 square feet in building A didn't really move it just, we just kind of changed it, this definition to community facility. 
and just left the retail as commercial square foot, square feet. And as we mentioned, our residential units, um, we increased them when we added residential units to the uh, podium of phase one. And then the Article 11 tax abatement, um, we're just hoping to um, correct uh, the portion of Lot 23 that was unintentionally omitted back in 2017. And that is in our presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I uh, just have a few questions. Uh, one reason for the need to amend this UDAP is to increase the number of residential units planned for this project. Can you speak to why the amount of planned residential units in this project increased? How has affordability in this project changed since the original resolutions for this project were issued in 2017? And if the affordability has changed, can you speak to why that was necessary for this project? Sure. Um, so the number of units changed, um, as I mentioned, because we needed to add some, some units to phase one when we took the podium down um, to replace, to, to be within our ULERP, uh, you know, bulk and scale requirements, we needed to add those units to the podium. Um, and we thought overall it was better to have an increased number of affordable units on site. Um, the affordability has changed since 2017. Um, when we, the UDAP uh, uh, summary says that 60% of the units need to be at 60% of AMI or below. Um, that has remained exactly the same. So we actually, I think, increased affordability a bit because now formerly homeless units are required as part of um, HPD's term sheets. And then in addition, I think originally we had contemplated that the AMI levels would go up to as high as 130% of AMI in 2017. We have now lowered those um, with feedback from Community Board 11 and um, council members. So we've lowered that now to 90% of AMI. So overall, the project has definitely increased um, overall affordability since it was originally conceived in 2017. Thank you. Has a commercial tenant been selected for the retail space in phase two? If not, is there a category of commercial tenant the developer would like to see occupy the space? Unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, a commercial tenant yet for that ground floor um, retail space. I think, um, I don't quite remember the use group for that. I think obviously, ideally from our perspective, we definitely want like a community oriented um, retail tenant for that space um, to enliven that corner and, you know, offer, you know, services that are welcome to the community and are needed. So that's who we'll be looking for um, as we kind of start construction and head towards finding a tenant prior to construction completion in 2024. The plans for phase two building A indicate that four community gardens will be included in the site. The community gardens were an important priority outlined in the initial RFP for this project. Can you please speak a bit more to the community gardens in this project and provide an update on the plans for the community gardens? What's the current status of conversation with the gardeners and what's the timeline look like for bringing the gardens back and putting them into this operation? Sure, um, so we had a pretty robust um, design development um, process with the gardeners to develop the community gardens um, to meet their specifications and meet the specifications of the parks. Um, you know, we're, we're currently, um, those are currently in the first phase of the project. So we are anticipating that um, we're working towards opening those gardens in uh, 2022 um, as part of the first phase. So that's, that's the goal. Um, and I, I think you know we're we're pretty excited about the designs of those gardens, and we had quite quite a lot of feedback from the gardens as we worked through that. What efforts will be made to keep the commitment made to the city council in the 2017 to hire locally uh, for at least 10 percent of the workforce on this project? How many local hires comprise phase one construction on this project? and has Positive Workforce, a local East Harlem organization, been engaged to assist with the hiring process thus far? 
Yes, so we have positive workforce on both phases of the project. So they're engaged on, um, they're engaged on uh, phase one. They also, positive workforce also did a number of OSHA, I think it's OSHA 30 trainings for us as well to like get um, local residents like ready to be hired. Um, I'm not quite sure the number of, I can get back to council on the exact number of um, local hires we've had um, so far. But, um, and they will be engaged as well on, on the second phase of the project. Thank you. And last question. Back in 2017, the council received a letter from Jonathan Rose Companions, um, excuse me, companies, indicating interest in redeveloping La Marquita. This is the facility of Sendero Verde project, essentially across the street from the development. Do you know if there's any updates on this redevelopment? Um, you know, we've spoken to some of the um, people that are working on La Marquetta, and I think that there is an, an idea. I, I think we're really excited about the potential for like synergy between our development and the La Marquetta space underneath, um, you know, in, in the middle of Park Avenue. Um, I think there was a thought that like the urban garden center would move um, to the location right across from us, which we think would be really nice with them. Um, the connection with our garden groups as well. Um, and I also think uh, Acacia Network, who is you know, our development partner on this project is also um, running programs with La Marquette as well. So I think there is a lot of connection there. I'm not quite sure where La Marquette is on their, their plans right now. Um, Okay, thank you so much. I would like, now like to invite uh, my colleague, Councilmember Barron, to ask her questions. I see her hand is raised. Councilmember Barron. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do apologize. I had to step away for a moment, but I have a question about the AMI. If you could briefly give me a summary of what the AMI is. I did hear you talk about 90%, but I didn't understand what portion of the project is. There. So how many how many units are there in total? And what's the breakdown of the uh, sure. income? I didn't, I didn't break them down in, in for both. I, I, both of them are separated by phase currently. Okay. But um, in phase one, we'll do phase one first. There's 361 units. 10% um, are formerly homeless. 20% uh, are at 30% of AMI. Um, uh, ten percent are at forty percent of AMI. Uh, ten percent are at fifty. Uh, You're saying 10%. six zero sixty six zero. Ten, yeah, ten percent are at fifty, and then ten percent are at sixty. Yep. Oh, ten and ten. Okay. Yep, ten and ten. Um, and then twenty percent are at eighty, and uh, twenty percent are at ninety. And that's the first phase. Um. The second phase has five income bands. It's 15% formerly homeless, 10% um, are at 30% of AMI, 15% uh, are at 50% AMI, 20% um, are at 60% AMI, and then the remaining 40% are at 90% of AMI. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, what is the neighborhood median income? What's the median income in that neighborhood? The median income is around uh, 27 to 30% AMI. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on these items? There are no members of the public signed up to testify on these items. If there are any, oh, excuse me, if there are any other members of the public who would, I'm sorry. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application numbers 202-15020 HAM and 202-15021 HAM related to Sendero Verde are now closed and the items are laid over.
That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicant members of the public and my colleagues, the subcommittee council, the land use staff and the sergeant at arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you everyone have a good day.